Live in Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity is committed to fostering an inclusive and diverse work environment where differences are valued, practices are equitable, and employees experience a sense of belonging that allows them to bring their full, authentic selves daily. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. So if you want to learn more about Doximity, go to your app store and type in D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Again, that's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Good evening, everyone. Happy Thursday. This is the Accent Point. Living Corporate is a digital media network concerning place diversity, equity, and inclusion. Living Corporate centers and amplifies black and brown voices in place through digital media production and B2B consulting. The network offers a variety of programming, including the Access Point. The Access Point is a weekly webinar focused on preparing black and brown aspiring and experienced professionals for the workplace by having the real nuanced talks they don't know they need. During each episode, we examine real changes people face at work and offer expert advice on dealing with your organization, your boss, your coworkers, and your career. So here's the big disclaimer. The thoughts and views expressed in tonight's discussion do not reflect the views of any organization the hosts or guests may be affiliated with. So we're going to get started. Let me start with me and tell you exactly who I am. I am Dr. Wendy M. Edmonds. I am an author of, I am also a professor at the oldest HBCU in the state of Maryland, Bowie State University, and I am also a management consultant. And here with me tonight, we have a our guest that will be introduced, and I'm going to turn to my awesome co-host, Mr. Dr. Lonnie Morris. You're Thank you on. so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy. Excited to be here on Thursdays, one of my favorite days. I am Dr. Lonnie Morris. I, too, am a management consultant and professor. I spend most of my days helping really, really smart people figure out organizational challenges to make work a much better place and to help you hate your job less. I am super excited about our guest today. Our guest is Dr. Terry Kidd, who is the Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness, Strategic Planning, Research, and Technology at St. Augustine's University in North Carolina. He's also the Chief Information Officer there, and he is an expert in organizational change, design, thinking, and analytics. He served on multiple state committees for workforce development and strategic planning, has, what, 15 peer-reviewed journal publications, 10 books, and he is also a recipient of the Houston Business Journal 40 Under 40. He is a super superstar. Dr. Kidd, welcome to the show. With with such an illustrious uh, introduction, man, I can walk on water. <laughs> I, am, I, I am very honored um, and humbled to be an invited guest on this show to discuss these very important topics. Um, I am currently at St. Augustine's University. Uh, we've just celebrated 157 years of Black excellence serving um, the Black community through this HBCU uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I feel very privileged and very honored um, to continue uh, that work and legacy of the HBCU in propelling Black excellence and the Black community forward. So thank you all for having me. And it is it is such an honor to have you here and very important because this we know is National HBCU Week. So we thought it was important to have a guest that represents the institutions and is near and dear to Dr. Wendy and I. I'm a two-time graduate of Morgan State University as well as uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And I'm a legacy kid. My father graduated from Morgan State as well. And Dr. Wendy, I know that's your experience. Same here, Bowie State University undergrad and University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Yes, indeed. That's right. So we are celebrating with you as you are celebrating St. Augustine's accomplishments and achievements. And this is a great conversation for the three of us to have this week. Our topic this week is something that's been coming up a lot in personal conversations as I work with coaching clients and just organizations in general. And it really is about aligning personal values with organizational culture. 
And I think w- when we think about this broadly, we know that organizational culture and its role in fostering belonging and wellness is a major to- major item of discussion right now. We hear wellness all the time. And we hear bring your whole self to work as sort of the central idea of how to make this happen. But I don't know that people are always clear on how to match those things together. So in our conversation tonight, we're going to really unpack what it means to align your values with your organization. So I think let's start here. It sounds cliche almost. We were just laughing about this before the show with our executive producer, but sometimes people really don't know what it means to align your values with work or your values with your organization. So Dr. Kidd, why don't you start us off? What what does that really mean? What's the what's the undercurrent there? So we it is funny that we were just having this conversation maybe a few days ago in executive cabinet when one of the VPs um mentioned how she was just exhausted from the type of job. And I mentioned to her, I said, well, are you working smarter, are you working harder? And are you working in the field that you should be working in? I said, because every time I saw her, she always had this arduous look on her face. She's oftentimes combative with people. And I just wanted to know if she just worked in the right environment. And so when we talk about aligning personal values with the organizational culture, part of this deals with an individual knowing themselves. What do they know are their personal ethics? Of course, their values. What do they bring to the table in terms of the spiritual component? What makes them them? And and what sorts of things do they esteem and value? For me, ethics, um, integrity, openness, um, camaraderie are, are, are high values that I, I esteem as an employee, um, as a manager. And I look for those kinds of things in organizations. Is this an organization where I can be my full collective self? Do I have to code switch? Do I have to hide elements of myself? Or can I just be free to be myself within this organization? And so when you look at, you know, personal values, and organizational culture, does the culture of that organization reinforce the tenets of who you are as a person or do they make you want to hide, change, shift, and be something different? And I think at this point in time in our culture, individuals are just not in tune to who they are as people and what they value as a people or as a person. And then they seek out organizations um, for various reasons, whether it's financial gain, economic stability, prestige, et cetera. They don't really look at the undercurrents of those organizations and what those organizations stand for. And I give you an example. We were going to do business um, with uh, a particular vendor, and then I discovered that this particular vendor um, was at one point uh, experimenting on animals. And I knew one of the people on the team Jeez. was the, right. She was the animal activist, and so we decided not to go with that client because the majority of our values saw that animal cruelty was just not a way to go as a company. So we went with another uh, vendor to sign for a contract. Um, I I think as a society, as social media um, uh, proliferates and as technology have made things a little bit more um, accessible, um, I feel that technology has made us lax as a society in terms of understanding where our value, not everyone, but some some of us, of course, you know, where, where do our values lie? And what are those values? And are those values um, um, from our upbringing? Did we learn those values as we matured and became older? Or do we just not know? And what I find is that in this particular organization and the last few that I've been with, individuals just have not done the deep soul searching to figure out mm. what their values are, what's near and dear to them, right? And yeah. are they working in a capacity that reinforces what's near and dear to them? And are they in an organization surrounded with people that have a similar like mind? So 
those are my thoughts so far. Oh, I, um, I, I love that because what I hear you saying is know yourself first, right? Before you seek an organization to validate you, you got to do your own homework. Right. And I would also posit that you have to get to learn yourself aside from what society says you should be, right? So as a black man, my entire existence is steeped in a um, sort of framing of how the prevailing capital, the prevailing society says a black man should be, right? And everything reinforces that's what that black man should be. However, I have to take a step back to say, I'm not going to be a part of that branding or, or, or social conditioning. I'm going to learn what it means to be a black man for myself. And I'm going to discover what that is for me. And I'm going to walk in that truth that I discover for myself and I be for myself. Deboer talks about this double-minded consciousness. And I was just having this conversation a few days ago as well about how, you know, sometimes people of color view themselves, they don't know themselves. So they come to know themselves from the views of what others have given them. And I said, we have to take a step back as people of color to learn ourselves for ourselves um, outside of these, these forms of institutional structural agents, right? And so you have to know yourself, know your ethics, know your values, know yourself and what you love and find near and dear. Because then once you've reached that peace, which Maslow's called self-actualization, right? You don't need the organization to validate yeah. you your role, spirit, and power, the ethos that you bring to that space reaffirms who you are and what you bring and what you can bring, not seeking validation from that organizational space because the organization may never validate you. Talk um, about it. May never validate they you. May never In most you. cases, will never. <laughs> will never. Will never, will never validate you. And so how do you as a person contend with that if you need, you know, that type of validation for self-esteem, self-efficacy, self-actualization? What does that mean for you and your values? That might mean you may shift your values just to be accepted or validated and or you might become something that you're not or work in a place that's not feeding your soul and reaffirming you. Uh, but causing you to act in a manner or display behaviors, that's not you. And that's very important if you um, bring to your work an element of spirituality, an element of service, an element of human centricness. Uh, those things may set up within you some internal conflict. And from what I've been reading in the industrial psych literature, some people will stay in a job because it's paying them um, um, it's paying them well, but it does not give them the sort of peace, self-actualization or reaffirming that they need as a person. So let me so let me take that for a second, Dr. Kiggs. That's a very important point. And we just saw this in uh, New York Post online this week did a story about a study that came faking happy at work. So to your point about you'll stay even if you don't really like it about aligning values. And what they found is that employees self-adjusted their mood to seem happier because of this misalignment with values at time. And the result was they end up being far more emotionally drained by the end of the day. So they may have come into work in the beginning feeling all right, but different things happen or just the, the the overwhelming nature of the job from the day before, the weeks before, starts to weigh heavy on you. And that meant they were not at their best to perform tasks all day, that they were a little more testy with their peers and weren't as responsive to interactions. And they found that it was such a depletion of energy and mental resources because of all the work you had to do throughout the workday to get to this place that was right. So I want to bring Dr. Wendy in on this a little bit. So what is this? So we, we're, we're clear now that we can't just we have to do our own homework about our values and then figure out what it means for the organization to do that. But people are faking happy. Right. And to Dr. Kidd's point, sometimes what you need is a job and you need money. So what do we do? 
well, be clear that you don't want to compromise your values because that turns to control. If people begin to see that you will do the song and dance to feel a sense of belonging, that is a sense of control. And we know that that creates nothing but toxicity in the workplace. So that's the danger zone that I would warn about. But being very clear about your own um, values is something that you should take on as a responsibility and really set some time aside to build that out. What does that look like for you? What are your own core values? You know how we often uh, on the job, we have these retreats to decide what are, what are the values of the organization? What's the mission of the organization? We should love ourselves. You mean those enough. long meetings to write these <laughs> these notes that we don't then perform? <laughs> yes, I remember those. <laughs> Everybody's been in one. But that's where we should take that time out. That's self-love. That's self-care. That's taking that time out to say, this is what I stand for. This is my belief system. And does the organization really line up with that? And one of the things that um, I love with everything about what you said, here's something that I thought about. You can work for an organization that val whose values line up with yours. But there can be a shift in the organization. And at some given point in time, that changes. You are so and right. So that's a, that's a decision point. Yes. I, I and, and you just spoke directly to an experience directly to me, right? So for 10 years, I was at one institution. And the institution, when I started and I accepted the job, was because it was family-oriented. They really valued... Um, time off being with your family they get you with that every time yes and, and, <laughs> and that the chancellor over that institution at the time she really wanted it to feel like home so we celebrated um uh, project milestones we gave bonuses she had christmas well that chancellor passed away and a new chancellor came on board from uh quote unquote the business world and you could just see within a matter of two or three years how it changed from a um, close-knit organization to more of a loosely coupled organization where toxicity started to creep in. And I had to make a decision after 10 years. You know, I was high in the organization. I was compensated well at the time. I was comfortable. But I had to make a conscious decision. Is this environment number one, reaffirming me as a Black uh, professional. Number two, um, is mm. this now feeding my soul? Is it, it, is it feeding my soul? Am I able to to those students in terms of connect to the resources so they can graduate and complete? Or is this a different organization? And I struggled with that because the benefits and the money kept pulling me back. But then it came to a point where I had to break away from that and be true to myself. And and I think these I think organizations that start off one way that change varying types of leadership, individual employees, in which I'm I'm very happy and pleased to see that millennials and Z generation, if they're not getting what they feel for their soul, they're changing and leaving. And that is a level of power that other generations may not have collectively had or was aware of that they could engage in. But we have to make that. So I, Go ahead, Dr. Wendy. Yes. I just wanted to also uh, make a comment about how the millennials and, and Gen Z are moving around, and that is excellent. And I want to remind those who move around to know your worth and negotiate and be yeah, prepared yeah. to negotiate and not compromise your values, right? Because just what happened to you going to another organization, if they say they may not pay you what you were being paid, but you do love the fact that it's going to be a different environment, beware not to allow them to pimp you for your professional being Not pimp you. don't allow that to take Save place you negotiate 
Yes, you are, you are hitting it right on the head. And there is power in moving around. There's power in negotiation because you were in the driver's seat. And if they really want you, as they say, as these companies say, they will um, be accepting and amenable to those demands. So that's interesting. I, I want to bring up this point because what we're talking about isn't new, right? People have talked about connecting your values and your purpose to your work, to your organization for a long time. In fact, almost what a couple of years ago, Harvard Business Review wrote something about uh, building a culture that aligns with people's values. What they found in looking this inf- looking into this information with employees is that less than 50% of the pl- employees believe that their company was committed to improving these types of organizational challenges that were giving people this angst around the values and the organization. And what they say, what we know, is that the things you can do as an employer, as an organization to help people sort of connect with this differently is allow people to speak up when they're having challenges or when they feel like there's a disconnect between the purpose that, they, that they're that they living in or they want to live in and how that connects to their, their job. To work on how the person's role in the organization and their job fits with their values. And we hear a lot about that in multiple types of organizations. And to connect people specifically to their personal values in what they're executing. You mentioned some of that, Dr. Kidd. So if this is not a new idea, I think maybe what's changing for us, at least some of us, a lot of us are dealing with this hybrid and remote stuff. So it's sort of this new culture where we're supposed to emphasize engagement, supposed to create these captivating experiences, but we're still not seeing the shift totally. So what is it that if you're the boss right now that you that you should be thinking of doing for your employees to help them better align the their values and purpose with your organization, with this work? Dr. Kid, Dr. Wendy. There we go. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so one thing that I've always valued are these psychological batteries, right? They give us some degree of, of an inkling of who we might be. And so when I was vice chancellor at another institution, I made the entire academic affairs faculty. Uh, academic staff and those student leaders all take this Myers Brig um, and this thing called Emergenetics, and it kind of gives you a kind of new E N T J. Yes, yes, I'm not an E N T. That's me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but gives you a sort of inkling of of what your personality is, and then from that, we do some type of meditation retreat. Um, around around what that means to the individual. And then from that, um, we dissect what we find near and dear to us, and we connect that together in a value tree. And what's interesting is that some individuals within that division never knew or put on paper what they valued. Like they would say they valued yeah. family, but on their on their um, art map, family wasn't on there. Um, They would say they valued education, but you saw other things on there. And so I think me working with with my divisions and and teams, it's really about getting down to the core of who they are as people. What drives you to come to work every day? This one lady drove two hours to work every day. Come on, sis. Why in the world did you do that? And yeah, she, speak to me. And I said, well, woman, I said, why are you doing that? I said, you do know I can approve you to work, you know, telework some days during the week. And she said that she does this because she loves to see the joy on the students' faces. She said, yes, I can teach online and I might think about teaching online. She said, but I really love seeing the young people the light bulb go off and the smile on their faces. She said, that's worth everything. That's worth yes. everything. And that really spoke to her values. It really spoke that she was human first. She was human centric, right? Um, and I said, man, I don't know if I can drive two hours. She said, 
He said you would if you loved what mm. you were called. So I had to step back and reflect on, do I really love what I do? What will I drive two hours for? That's true, because I've driven two hours to restaurants, to airports, all kinds of things. And I took a step back and I looked at myself and I said, would I drive two hours to a job? And at the conclusion of that reflection, I said, I had to have loved what I was doing. Mm. I do not feel that most in corporate America and or in the workforce in the United States love what they're doing. They're doing it out of obligation. They're doing it out of circumstance. They're doing it because it's routine and they need stability. They need the certainty of stability. Mm. And I that love. is translated to slave. Oh, yep, 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 yep. yep. Dr. Wendy always throws the elbows. There we go. I, I, I didn't <laughs> want to go there. I didn't want to go there. But that is, that is a byproduct of capitalism and a capitalistic society. It we is. don't want you doing what you love. We want you to do what is going to make us create a life for us to love. So we're working to make CEOs billionaires. We're working to make, you know, other billionaires stay billionaires. And we just want a piece of the crumbs. And that's all they give you. Oh, uh, I, I, I think ahead. about the leaders. Uh, I'm loving this conversation. I, I'm thinking about leaders uh, cannot identify um, what it is. Like you were able to just hone in and say, what is, ask the question, what is bringing you to work every day after a two hour commute? Why do you? that but there are leaders who have difficulty in even recognizing value conflict like maybe what they're doing doesn't line up how can i help and so there needs to be some training for the leaders to be able to identify that that's not something that you want to ignore or say whoo that's great or abuse just what value that person brings right that's so unique you were you were interested enough to ask the question to find out what is it about you and so some leaders aren't aren't really there they're not there to be able to do that and understanding how do i make this uh work for everyone in the organization instead of making this person seem as though there's something wrong with what they're doing Right, or, and so that's a go ahead, you, or right. abuse it, right? Or abuse it because you see someone so dedicated. You're so right, Dr. Wendy. You're you're speaking. It's as almost that the heavens have opened. You are speaking. <laughs> do you the, do you see a halo <laughs> right now? Is that what you see? <laughs> yes, yes. So the leadership, you just sometimes scratch your head about how do you derive to that decision or how do you derive to what you're doing? Like what you're doing doesn't make any sense. Right. And you just hit it on the head. Some are not aware or possess the emotional intelligence to be aware of, of, of what those types of value systems are because they've never done the hard, deep work on figuring out who they are as a person or as a leader. Every, you, you know, I was talking to this um, ACE Leadership Forum. It prepares higher education leaders. And my first question to them was, do you know exactly what you're getting into? I said, because if Most you people don't, don't, they don't. I said, because if you don't, you're going to be upset most days and you're going to quit and burn out. And I said, that's why that. you need to figure out why you're there and what values are going to sustain you there. Because trust me, these organizations will grind you up, chew you up, spit you out, and bring the next one. But you have to have something within yourself that is going to ground you. You cannot expect your manager or your leader to do that because oftentimes they don't possess those skill sets themselves to provide you that guidance. 
And so, and then sometimes right. it's not it's not of any fault of their own, right? We're saying these are organizational responsibilities that right. you should be training people and developing leaders to recognize these signs and to move people along to continue in that. So, I, I want to bring up something else here that's that's sort of important, and you already mentioned this about looking into literature, Doctor Kid. So, there is this idea in psychology literature in industrial organizational psychology. There is this theory of person organizational value you fit. It is a thing. And people research this and people write about it. And it really is about the congruence of one's individual beliefs and values with the culture, norms, and values of an organization. It's everything we're talking about right here. So this is not, uh, I don't want to say, so rocket science is pretty cliche, but it is research science, right? So this is a notion that people are aware of, that we push. And what we find is that is very, very uh, impactful when it comes to employee performance and employee engagement. So when your values are aligned with those of the organization or the organization's espouse values and the ones on which on which they act or resonate with you, that your experience in the works is is different. So I want us to figure out how do we help people get there? And I think particularly you mentioned some of this, Dr. Kip, because there are some differences in generations, right? So our earlier generations and the boomers and X, some of us sort of could sit in the job for 10 years, even if we didn't love it that much, yep. we might have to drive a little longer. So how do we move the, the needle now? So I, I, the beauty is, is that the younger folks are challenging a, a number of structures within the workplace. And it's forcing us to kind of think about, well, do we really need that? Why do we have this? A lot of these assumptions about work. Um, I discovered three of the folks in my division could work 100% remote. And I found that they were more productive 100% remote than me having them come into the office. So I just made a deal with them and said, hey, would you like to continue this this remote? Um, I said, I know you have children. You have to go to daycare, blah, 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 blah. I said, how would you like to try this out for a year. And so you have to be willing to get outside of that comfort zone and experience it, right? I think organizations have to be willing to dismantle the sort of institutional structures that they've held um, in high regard, high esteem, uh, assumptively so, because they've really never challenged the notion of those structures. And so listening to the young people and figuring out what's near and dear to them and sort of looking at ways in which we can innovate organizations um, through a compromise. It, it can't be 100% one way or zero, no, or the other way. I, I think by listening and taking into account the voices of the employees about what's working for them and what does not work for them, oftentimes management structures a job or structures an organization for what works for them and not what works for the employee. Preach and about I, it. I think we need to reflect back on that because, you know, process improvement teaches us that if your processes, practices, and procedures do not reflect the end user, then you have incongruence and you have to go back and look at that. So we have to take a look at that. Are these processes, practices, and procedures reflective of those who are using them? And if the answer is no, you have to be courageous to say, let me go talk to these individuals and figure out what is near and dear to them and how can I make things better for the organization? Because happier employees, we know, produce more. We know this for a mm. fact. And we also know that when you support what's near and dear to an these, they'll run an extra 10 miles for you. Because they'll drive they'll two know. hours to get to. They'll, they'll yep. drive that two hours. <laughs> they'll drive that ahead, two hours. Well, you know, I'm thinking about the the structure, institutional structure, uh, organizational structure has to. I mean, COVID has forced us to look differently at how we do things. So, being stuck in your own ways is never is not going to be a good thing. So some of the decisions are driven by the fact that a lot of the companies and organizations have made a huge investment in real estate. And there was always yeah. this false reality of, Speak oh, on. we can't, we can't trust you from working at home. 
We don't have the technology to work from home. All of that was null and void when COVID showed up. And now it is forcing us to look at how are we going to do business? And it's very difficult. It's very difficult because it means that no longer can the organization share those stories because they're no longer valid. It means they have to come to the table and they have to compromise. And that's very difficult where the challenge is. You cannot say where you took the different approach with your employees and said, hey, let's try this for a year. There are organizations that say, if you want your job, you have to come back today, right now. And that's about control and the slave mentality. I'm going to control you. I need to oversee you. I need to watch you. To I don't trust you enough for you to do the right thing. So what does that say about the values of those individuals? Is that a person you want to be around with after five o'clock? Would you trust that person around your children or your insignificant other? Would you trust that person to make a decision for you, knowing that they want to uh, surveillance, not trust you on the job, want to be over you, control you? Are those the types of people that you want running your organization? And these are just things that we have to think about um, as we work with these organizations. So I, I love where this is going. And, and what I recognize is when we see turnover and people leaving their jobs and people are having these conversations because they recognize that there's a misalignment between their values and organization. And we know, and we talk about this almost every week, the whole idea of quiet quitting. And I've been reading stuff about quiet firing and all the things related to that, the great resignation, the big quit. And I saw something on the next web earlier this week. And it says, uh, if you can't remember your last good day at work, it's time to quit. Right? Lord. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but, 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 but what I want the two of you to weigh in here is it's not always the best option right now, right? Everybody can't just pop up and say, I've re I'm listening to you, Dr. Lonnie. I know my values are different than this organization, but I can't quit tomorrow. Why so not? how do you navigate? Well, well, let's say there are some of us who can. I know that, no, Dr. Kidd, you are the rebel in encouraging that. But for those who may not be able to do that tomorrow, how do they navigate it for the rest of the week, the rest of the month? My question is, is it they can't do it because of fear? They can't do it because of uncertainty? Because you don't have to do anything in this universe but die. That's the only immutable truth. Everything else, Ooh. you have the power to do. And I always say you have a right not to be devalued, oppressed, depressed. You have a right to be treated with dignity and respect. You have a fundamental right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if an organization and or your job is stripping that away from you, you have the right to make an immediate change as best suited for you and your sub-collective interests. Immediate change is what the doctor said. And that, that, that piece I read in on the next web, the, the second part of that title was, the subtitle was, Bye, See You Never. That's what Dr. Kidd is saying. Bye, let it go. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Wendy, thoughts on that? I totally agree. And the way that you walk away with grace, with a smile, bye, see you later, is to always keep yourself marketable. You do that by reading every day. You have to stay on top of things, your area of expertise, whatever that may be. You have to know that and know that well. Some people may call it arrogance. Some people may call it confidence. What I would recommend is that you always keep yourself above board by staying in the know, by um, investing in yourself, loving yourself with professional development. There are so many things that are free and available, including college courses, including trainings. There are things that are that are very valuable that's at our fingertip. If you have a cell phone, you have access. And so when you have that, you can go anywhere. You can smile as you leave, but you deserve 
to make sure that the organization that you work for does line up with your values. If it is conflicting and it is affecting you, I used to have this saying when I worked in um, in in industry in corporate America, where you know the co- curtain goes up in the morning, and at five o'clock, whoo, curtains go goes down. And that was that was a thought that I had as a result of an experience in in one of my positions, and so when you feel that way, it's time to run. Yeah, that's the mental exhaustion we're talking about. Go ahead, Doctor Kid. Not just mental exhaustion, burnout to a point of no return. Um, I I would like to caveat what I was saying. Yes, you have the right to leave. We want to be strategic and we want to use some discernment, right? If you have family to take care of, you just can't up make rash judgment type decisions, right? But always have a plan, have a backup plan and always be looking because if one employee is paying you X amount of dollars, you're probably worth 30% more than that. And somebody out there. Wait a minute. What you saying? You meant you say I need to drive two hours to go somewhere else right now. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm saying. Today. That's what I'm saying. Today. Today. I, I know of two cases. One young lady actually worked in HR management, human resources. And, you know, she said they kept promising her, promising her, promising her. Well, after two years of promises, she just decided to leave, right? And so she discovered that she made three jumps in one year and gained well over $70,000 in additional compensation. And she said that just taught me that those organizations were undercompensating her for what she was being to the table. Yeah. That's, that's about your value and your, your, your personal values and your value to the organization. That's your, right. That's why you stay marketable. That's right. You stay marketable. But pursuant to what I was speaking towards, you know, I think the blessing in COVID, if, if we can find the silver lining, as she discussed, well, that it's a new paradigm. Whether you were going willingly or not, right? It just forced everyone to have to move forward and rethink a number of things. And I like the fact that the young people are saying, um, here are my demands. Either you want my talents, but here are the demands that come with it. And I, I will never forget, I, I, I hired one of them, great person, great worker, great attitude. But one day he walked into my office and said, Dr. Kidd, um, sign up to, to work to eight and sometimes nine o'clock on projects. And he said, so I'm going to offer you my two week notice. And I said, no, no, why would you do such a horrible thing? And he said, well, one of my values is Mm. I want to protect my boundaries and my personal time. And he says, that's very important to me. And Mm. he said, Mm -hmm. you're assigning things that's causing us to work well after work out. And I couldn't do anything, y'all, but respect that. Mm. Absolutely. He gives his two weeks notice. Then he sends him an email in two weeks from another job saying, I've gotten hired. He left the right way. He recognized that this particular environment at this time wasn't in sync with his values. He made a conscious decision and he came and talked to me about it. I couldn't be upset with the person. I had to accept his decision and the reality. And that caused me to go back to rethink my approach to that. So you always have to have a leader in an organization who's willing and courageous to do self-reflection, to think about the ways in which they are operating and how that is affecting the people in that unit, and be courageous on the fly to make things better. That's I love what you call that. a win-win situation. That's leaving with a smile, allowing you to reflect and grow. That's a win-win. You know what I also love about it is that we just got Dr. Kidd to confess that he was a toxic boss, and you have been no healed. Way. I love that. Picked. There you go. Hey, you <laughs> learned your lesson. You there you go. I appreciate that so much. Well, I wouldn't call him a toxic boss, <laughs> <laughs> but I do. But I do. But I do think 
leaders have to take a step back and think about, you know, just because you value something doesn't mean those values are in sync with the rest of the folks in your mm. union. Yeah. So we, we can't assume that the way we approach things, the way we see things or understand things are the ways in which the folks you hire will see and do things. Oftentimes we try to hire many us. And what COVID and this new generation of folk in the workplace has been teaching me is that you can't, it's an enigma, but one thing that they care about are their values and they will leave a job in a heartbeat. Mm. That's also the power of the the courageous father. That done decently in order, the approach that he took to leadership allowed allowed you to grow, allowed you to make the change. So a lot of times people think the leaders and organizations are the only ones who have power to make change. When in fact, the change started with the subordinate, the change that, that everyone else benefited from after he left was a result of the courageous follower who said to say, this isn't what I'm going to do. This isn't, it, this doesn't, this is out of alignment. And, and the great thing about this was that he asked for a recommendation for the next job. And I gave it, I said, he was a great employee. And they said, well, was there anything that you would say is a weakness? And I said, not so much a weakness. I said, he, he had to reevaluate for himself his work schedule. And I said that work schedule provided him an opportunity to reflect on what was important to him. And I said, when he submitted his notice, I said, it was much more of a reflection on me as the leader. And I'm not sure if leaders, some leaders are willing to take that look of introspection to see. Yeah. Right. We always, we always want to appear as infallible, you know, always on the one, Sometimes you have to take a step back and reevaluate what you consider near and dear and make compromises with folk within your organization. So I think I hear you saying part of this is that there's some negotiation in this around even if we have some core values at the organizational level, that how those manifest and how we put those into action together collectively can make a very big difference. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, I was having a D and I, a D E and I discussion several weeks ago with the Fortune 500, and you know I just kind of got tired of them doing the song and dance. And I, you know what? I said, bring up the web and show me the faces of everyone on this board of directors. Let's do mm -hmm. it right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, this will tell me your values and your commitment to DE and I. And of course, like clockwork, it was all one group of people, one one gender. And I said, now explain to me again how you value yeah. DE and I when there's no representation here, no diversity here, no inclusion equity here. And it got real silent. And I said, well, I think my part in this meeting is over. I said, come back to the institution when you're able to have a much more uh, substantive discussion about moving the needle and really transforming um, pathways into employment and promotion. And then you got in your car and you drove two hours home. <laughs> I drove to the waffle house and I ate lunch. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So I think as we start to sort of wrap up our conversation for the evening, there are a few things I want to reflect on. What we've heard today about aligning your values with the organization and checking out there's some important notes for you as an employee for self, right? So there's know yourself and don't seek an organization to validate you but do that own personal validation and then seek organizations that fit within that validation structure. Create your own narrative and don't be willing to compromise on your values just for a sense of belonging. If that can be a pretty discouraging exchange there and ask 
is this work? Is this ocean feeding my soul? I love this idea of, and I'm going to use this from now on. Would I drive two hours to do this? Dr. Wendy told us to be sure to look for signs of control in the organization. Develop your expertise and your confidence. Invest in yourself and to always stay looking for the next opportunity that helps you get to a closer alignment of the values as your values evolve. Or a leader or a supervisor in this space, invest in some personality assessments to help people get a better better clarity around who they are and how to articulate that in the organization and for you to understand how to make those things work together, to connect through your links and values. To invest in emotional intelligence because that helps you recognize some of these challenges. We want all of our leaders and developing leaders to challenge the structures that exist in organizations right now by listening to employees and enacting those things we want to see change. Be courageous in your own self-reflection, Dr. Kidd told us. Think about what people are saying, how they challenge your presence, how they challenge your leadership and adjust as necessary. Don't assume that your values are the same as everyone else's, at least not how they manifest and how they work together and be great at introspection. Organizations should be willing to reinforce who people are, not just who the organization is. And then we should understand how to navigate as our organization shifts and evolves and grows. We should train people organizations to recognize misalignment of values and be very intentional about dismantling the structures that exist that create this imbalance. Did I get them all? Yes, you, you did. got them all. <laughs> I got them you all. I got them all. I got them all. So as we think about those three areas of what to do for yourself as an employee, if you are a boss or heading that way to be somewhat or leading other people how to think about it, and if you're at the strategic level in the organization, these are things we want you to think about. In the end, we always ask this question. So if you don't take this advice, if you don't think about the things we just laid out here, what's the tax that we pay? What's the black tax here? If you don't do it this way, what do you run a risk of? Dr. Wendy, what's the black tax here? Say that one more time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My technical issues. So if you if we ask everybody, think about these things you do for self as the employee, if you're the boss and at the organizational level. So if you don't take heed to this advice and all the great things we discussed tonight, what's the black tax you pay here? What's the consequence? Loss. Mm. Loss of self. Loss of self-interest. Loss of self-belonging. Don't let that happen to you. Mm. Dr. Kidd, what's the black tax here? What's the consequence? Um, I would say spiritual death. You just become, you just start existing. You just stay in a job just because of certainty. And you, you don't evolve to your highest collective self. You are not a blessing to other people. Um, you become more of a hindrance of toxicity um, um, and you draw the life out of others. So you become um, fit for nothing, basically. Mm. And if you are fit for nothing, I'm sure it's going to be hard for you to recognize when you had the last day, last good day at work. It's time to say bye. See you never. Makes sense to me. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Terry Kidd, for your expert advice and opinions and knowledge. And thank you for sharing so much in this rich conversation. It is always a pleasure to engage with you. I appreciate you sharing time with us this evening. Dr. Wendy, my wonderful co-host, always a pleasure to sit and chat with you every week. This is one of my favorite things to do all week long. I am Dr. Lonnie Morris. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you want to continue to connect with Living Corporate, our social media channels are on the web. We're at livingcorporate.tv. Twitter's at Living Corporate. On LinkedIn, we're at living-corporate. Instagram is at Living Corporate. And wherever you can get your podcast, this show is the access point. Thank you so very much. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Be well. This episode of Living Corporate is brought to you by Blind. Blind is a safe, trusted community of more than 5 million verified professionals. Head over to teamblind.com. 
to get the latest insights into salaries, company reviews, and interview experiences at thousands of companies worldwide.